like a hero who takes the stage when we're on the edge of our seats saying it's too late. Well, let me introduce you to grace, grace, God's grace. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross. by might, not by power, by your spirit, God, send your spirit, God, not by might, not by power, by your spirit, God, send your spirit, God.
out a hand clap. Praise God. We're so blessed to have such a team that can minister to us as we just present ourselves to God and offer our praises and adoration to the Lord. So we're so grateful for all they're doing and um, just the, the continued work that they keep doing to help make our worship better. We're so thankful for them. Well, this morning as we get into the message, I do have a video clip for us. It's a, a short little clip, but it helps us understand our role and position with Christ. So we'll see that video now. pandemic may try to dictate to us the way we do it may seem a little different but like era throughout time there's always been those changes that have been made but we're still called for mission and of course with this being October we're doing a, a not a Halloween theme because we know Halloween can be about uh, spirit yes but not the Holy Spirit and we want to focus on the Holy Spirit and yes Halloween can be fun for us we enjoy it there's things of it that's good but we also know there's the dark side of it but instead of celebrating the dark side, we want to look at the power of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. So we've been looking at very aspects of it, of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to look at that part of, of the boldness, the ability to go out into our world, to be that testimony of Christ. And this section is, is reminding us of that command of Christ, which we are to be. And I don't know about you, but I grew up even in the evangelical church, a Pentecostal church. So whenever they would have evangelical outreach, it was quite frightening at times because it would be that we had to go out on a street corner, pass out pieces of paper to people that we may not have known. We either in either on a corner or in front of a store. We even did the door to door thing. And so anytime they would talk about it's going to be outreach time, you just kind of cringe and think, oh. Maybe if you're an extrovert, that's not so bad, because with extroverts, they can talk to anybody at any time. But when you're a little on the shy side, it's a little more difficult for us. So we, you know, and then we would have people who would just rush by us and not take our flyer, and we were persecuted for Jesus. It was just that sense that if they didn't take our flyer, they were denouncing Christ. And, of course, much like today, if you... If I have to bake a cake for a couple that's same-sex marriage, I'm being persecuted for Jesus. We don't know what persecution is, and I hope we never do. But yes, there are those that, that do feel that that is what called, God has called them to do. They are to stand on a street corner. If God has called them to do that, then great. But my trauma, having done that as a kid, when we do our, our, our outreaches, we've done it in fun places. We've gone to festivals. And it's a place where you do forget to present who you are and what you believe. And then those who are, are drawn to your booth are able to come to your booth. It, to me, that's a lot easier for, for my personality and my style. But it still means that we are to be witnesses. We are to go out into our world. 
And then for us to be a witness, though, doesn't mean just sharing our story of Christ. How are we living? How are we living around other people? Do they see the light of Christ in us? When you're in the grocery store, do they see someone who's difficult or grumpy or complainy? Or they see someone with love and peace and joy in their heart and life? Those are the places we can shine and be a witness of, of who God calls us to be. We don't have to have a bullhorn. It's just being that who God has called us in our life. So we're going to look at a couple of passages. One is in Acts 1, 4 through 8. And it's one that we commonly know, and it's often con connected, of course, to the, uh, the Holy Spirit. It uh, says, on one occasion, while he, Jesus, was eating with them. Again, showing us he was, when he rose from the dead, he wasn't a spirit. He actually was there in the flesh. And it also shows us, what did he say before he left? I will not eat with you again until I've been brought into my kingdom. So it shows us the kingdom of God is in operation now. And he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father's promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now Matthew also regards this command of Christ in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and he says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And in that authority, he says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And how do we know Jesus is with us? Through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we want the Holy Spirit and desire this work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And, and in these passages, Jesus has given us our mission. It means we are to live our faith in the world. Now, I know often you hear people say, well, never talk about politics or religion, but it seems like that's been thrown out the window for the last several years. But still, it's a sense that, that we need to talk about these things. They are things that help us to develop, to learn, and to grow. But we can live our faith as St. Francis of Assisi, who just his name, I always thought he should be the gay man's uh, uh, patron saint. But what he did say was, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. And that's pretty much where we need to be in our life as we allow the Holy Spirit to use our talents, our gifts, and our abilities. That way, when we're not an extroverted person, then we're not feeling like, oh, we're not doing our part, that we're not being able to share as we should. We can kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Those who feel led to speak, great, they can speak. We will encourage them. They can demonstrate their faith by speaking their words. But others of us may be a little more shy and, and find other ways which God will help us express our witness and our faith of what Christ has done in our life. But are we reflecting the Holy Spirit and Christ in our life? So as we look at Acts 1, what we see is Jesus gives three pronouncements to them. Three things that he expects. And the first one he gives to them, the first pronouncement is, you're commanded to wait. They were to wait for that time which for them was fine. They were scared to death. Here Jesus was gone. Everything they knew, everything the way things had always been done is now shifted and changed, and they're scared to death. So they were fine just staying in the upper room, meeting together, praying together, just being there. And often for us, we think that that thing of waiting is that we're just kind of twiddling our thumbs. We're just kind of like, okay, eventually it will happen. But we know waiting is doing I know I can be very impatient for waiting for things to be done, uh, when especially with things around here that we're kind of wanting done. It's like, why can they be done yesterday? Why are we still waiting for someone on this? Why don't they know we have other things to do? <laughs> and these type of things get us impatient, but it's not that kind of waiting. Waiting for Jesus means that, that we have a part to play. It is something that we prepare ourselves it is that being able to hear God speak to us, to be in a place to hear God speak, to be able to be a place to read God's word, that ability to prepare of what things need to happen in our life. 
Now, too often we want to speed it up. We want it done quickly, and we're capable of doing so much. God has given us that ability, but we need to make sure that we're tested and tried and ready before we go out into this world God has put us in. Now, for them, they didn't have to wait very long. They only had 10 days for which they had to wait. For us, it may be a bit longer. There may be work that God is doing in your life to prepare you to be able to do whatever that ministry is. That work that God has called you to do in which you can be a witness. And realizing that God knows timing better than we do. We just do our part. We wait to, to wait. We get in that idea of that waiting around. We don't do well with it. We think any day now. But know that with God, when he's telling us to wait, it's because he's working. Whenever things aren't moving as fast as we want, sometimes we just need to take a breath and say, Okay, God, it's in your hands. You will direct, you will guide whenever it's time. Will we wait for that direction of God? And he's commanded us as a sign of obedience. Will we take time to spend time with God? Or are we just too anxious to just get something accomplished? Can we wait? In Psalms 5.3 it says, Each morning you listen to my prayer as I bring my request to you and wait for the reply. So there again, it's, it's not saying that your devotions must be in the morning. I know people get in that debate. Is it first thing in the morning or last thing of the day? Wherever you are with your walk with God, God will tell you. But for the psalmist, it was in the morning. But he knew that as he offered his praise to God, it was a sense of then waiting for God to do the work. And that's where we just start being resting in God, knowing that it's going to be as God planned. And so as they were waiting, we know that as they waited, they talked about God, they worshiped God, they honored God, they were together as a fellowship. And we're also told in the Psalms, in Psalm 46, 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. Often whenever we're not sure what to do is when we just need to wait in God's presence and not the twiddling the thumbs but wait in his presence to extol God, to honor God, exalt God, because as we get our focus on God, it helps us to start seeing God work. It start helps us see the power of God that can work through us. And of course, when God told them to wait in Jerusalem, he's doing it for their good. He did it for them to concentrate, to prepare, to know. And in our obedience to God, it may be a while before we know where God's directing us as well. Like I said, they only had 10 days before they were hit powerfully with what to do. But for us, we may have to wait. And there's times I know if people have asked, well, well, what's your five-year plan for the church? And I can tell you a business plan, an idea of what I would like to see, what I'd like to go. But I also know it's kind of like with Moses that he didn't really know exactly what all was going to happen. He had to wait till the cloud moved to know where God wanted them to go next. But in the process, he prepared. They did what they needed to do, but they made it to their promised land. And I would have had no idea five years ago that we'd be back in this location. But I knew God had a plan. I knew God was directing us. I knew that we needed to go where we went for a time because uh, if we were looking at rents for a while, and that would have been anywhere from 120 to 160,000 a year. That would have chipped away at what we had got. And through what happened, God gave us back everything we paid and more. So it just shows us that sometimes waiting for God, we may not know what it looks like. We may not get it. We may not understand why, but God has a purpose and plan. And as they were told to wait, they were willing to do it. But I find it very interesting that in verse 9, Jesus in in mid-sentence, it's like he's telling them his last commands for what they were to do. And he tells them, wait in Jerusalem. And they're, well, Jesus, are you going to set up your kingdom now? Is that why you're doing it? And how often do we do that? God tells us to do something. Like, oh, you're going to do this now, God? Is this what you're about? And we start interrupting God rather than waiting for God to finish his thought. And, of course, he tells them it's not time for that. God the Father knows whenever the time for the kingdom will be established. He's got that all lined up. That don't, you don't need to worry about that right now. But we're the same way. As soon as things start getting an upheaval in our world, from the 80s on at different times, oh, Jesus must be coming back. Jesus must be coming back. And he said, no, I've still got work for you to do. You keep doing the work till I get there. And yes, we live waiting for our Messiah to return. But every time there's a bad situation, we don't automatically jump to the fact, well, Jesus must be coming back. We continue waiting, continue working, continue doing what God has called us to do. The second proclamation that he gives us is 
that you will receive the promise. So after they obey, even then they had to be time of quiet because they were already interrupting, so there was work to do in their life. But then whenever Jesus continued his thought again, said, you will receive the promise. Not you might, you will. It's a command of God. And when God commands something, it is going to happen. And can you hear God say to your own heart, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit into your life. That Greek word spirit does mean spirit, but it means breath. It means wind. And of course, in chapter 2, we see that a mighty wind came through whenever the Holy Spirit came upon the church. May that breath of God blow on us as well. May we be open to the breath of God. May we sense this power of God in our life. And that is the next step of our walk. That once we get to that place of where God has had us wait for a while, then we receive that, connect, that, that power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And this is different from our experience of accepting Christ. The Holy Spirit's first work in our life is to convict us and to help us understand we need a Savior. And that's him being with us, drawing us to, God's, to God. And then we start seeing that next work of the Holy Spirit that then starts directing us to help us fulfill these tasks that God puts within us. And that's why there may be a waiting time but from the time of when you say yes to Christ to where you start being active and working in the kingdom of God. But this Holy Spirit then empowers us with that supernatural ability to act, to speak, and to know. Those are the things that God does through the Holy Spirit that helps us do the impossible. There are things that the church can do that would be impossible just on our own, but it's through the power of God. Now we see through this that the Holy Spirit is the backbone of the church. If Christ is the head and we're the members, then apparently the Holy Spirit's the spinal cord, directs us, leads us, prompts us. But the promise of the Holy Spirit was the gift that transformed their lives and our lives. Yes, there's that initial work of believing when we start our walk with God to understand the resurrection of Christ and to make that make logical sense to us when it's not logical in human terms. But there's more. There are other aspects. Jesus made this promise in John 14, 16, and 17, and it said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Some of your Bibles may say counselor, helper, to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, and he lives with you and will be in you. The ability to the Holy Spirit that, yeah, the Spirit of God was present in Christ, was with them, but there would be that indwelling of them after the day of Pentecost. And don't we need that spirit of truth today? There are so many things that we are told, well, God says, and we're like, mm, it doesn't feel right. We need the spirit of truth to make those things sit, sit within our heart and life to know it is God. And it's through that indwelling of the Holy Spirit poured in our life that then gives us the ability to do as God has called us to do. But we have to be willing to receive. Are you open to what God wants to do in your life? Are you willing to say, God, whatever you do, you do it? In John 16, 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper the advocate, the counselor, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Again, showing us why Jesus had to leave. Yes, Jesus ascended full glory, power, and might, but had he stayed with us, it would still be one person in one location in the world. And that would not have been able to draw the whole world to God. So by Jesus ascending and sending the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit to us, then this spirit of Christ surrounds the whole world to where at any time, any place, the Holy Spirit can start working in our lives to do the work that Christ was doing while he was on the earth. It shows us the need for this power of God in our life. And that promise that was given isn't just for those 12 disciples, or 11 at that point. It wasn't just for them. It wasn't just for the 500 who saw him, or the 120 that actually showed up that day for service. But it was shown that it is for all of us. Peter tells us this in Acts 2, 8, 38 and 39. He says, change your hearts and lives. Change the way you think. And be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's step one. And doing that, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and all who are far away 
It is for everyone the Lord our God calls to himself. The same way we receive Christ into our life is how we receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever we come to that knowledge and acceptance of Christ, who he is, it was just open up our heart to receive and say, Jesus, you can have leadership of my life. The same with the Holy Spirit. As we start realizing that we need the power of God, that we can't do things in this world just on our own, that's where we start relying and calling out to God again and saying, God, I want to receive your spirit within my life. And they didn't know what that was going to look like 10 days later. They had no idea they'd be speaking in languages they did not know. They did not know that it's going to be sending them out into the world. They had no clue. They were just open to receive. And that's where we go as God, wherever you want to take me, whatever you want to do, I just want to be open to receive, and I receive you into my life to come into my heart, do whatever it is I need to fulfill your purposes for me. All we have to do is ask. Jesus said in Luke eleven thirteen. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Who gets to receive? All who ask. Well, don't you have to be holy? And it says all who ask. Don't you have to be a leader or a pastor of the church? No, all who ask. We just go to God in faith and we'll receive. And perhaps you are going to have some time of waiting as they had to wait in Jerusalem. Maybe there's some things God wants to get in order in your life to make you effective. But no, you're not going to be perfect. If you ever wait to be perfect, to take a step, to be that witness, that testimony, however God wants to use your life to do it, you'll never do it. But the reason the Holy Spirit was sent was to help the disciples do the work God called them to do. And the Holy Spirit then empowers us to do those things that we may look at and think this is totally impossible. There's no way this can work. And God makes it work. The Holy Spirit gives you that supernatural ability to act, to speak, and to know things that you may not have known otherwise or been able to do otherwise. It's what the Holy Spirit does. And God will use our intellect, yes. God works along with that which we know. And the Holy Spirit then rises up within us and takes us to the next step. So how we got this idea that if you're not prayed up but psyched up or perfect enough, I don't know how we got that in the church. But God uses sinful people to minister to sinful people. Years ago, I had a pastor friend tell me, he says, you know, we're just screwed up people helping other screwed up people get to heaven. And that's pretty much how it is. Because we're not doing it in our ability, we're doing it with the power of God in our life. And once they were at that point to receive, which the waiting will help us get to that point of willing to receive what God has for us, then he gives them that fir third proclamation. It isn't a matter of them staying safe in the upper room. It wasn't them just remembering the good old days. Remember when we sat with Jesus here. Remember when we saw Jesus do that and in our own life. Oh, I remember when I got this from God or when God did this for me. And we need to remember those things because those testimonies help build our faith for the future and help encourage other people. But if we're just dwelling on that and thinking what God has done, we're not going to look for the future. So what God says is at that third point is once you wait and you get that sense that I am there, once you are open to receive, then you will go. Then you will go, not you might go. It's going to be such a burning in your heart that you've got to do these things God has put within your heart or you're going to feel like something isn't being accomplished that you should. And then he tells them a list of where they're going to go, but for us it may be different. All three proclamations here required action. For us to wait takes action because you've got to spend time in prayer and in the word and in fellowship with other believers. You still go about life, but you're still waiting in anticipation. God, what are you opening up for you next? To receive the Holy Spirit, you've got to be open to that. You've got to be willing to receive. What is God putting on your heart? If you have ever thought, or even if the words crossed your lips and saying, well, you know the church should do, that could be God speaking to your heart of what he wants you to do because who's the church? We are. And you can't spell church without you. So it means we're all in this together. We have to work. Each of us has a purpose. Each of us has a call. Each of us has a different mission and a direction, but it's to accomplish that which God is wanting to do, and that's to draw people into that understanding of Christ. And do we need this more now than ever? 
It's the fact that we start seeing some things that are said in the church that's either one extreme or the other. We've either gone so extreme with the whole nationalism thing or we go that everything's just social justice. Where are we in the work of doing what Christ has and find that balance in between? How do we find what God wants? Are we accomplishing the purpose God has put within our hearts? Because we had also been given another command. Actually, it's Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, but it's something we need to receive as well. He says in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, You've heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. And the things that we speak, hopefully from the word of God, is from reliable witnesses for thousands of years. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. That is a command. We are to instruct other people. That's why I think Frank's job with the kids is so important because he's instructing these young ones for their future and understanding of Christ. God may put different people in your life that you're to help instruct and to guide. And whenever they're in trouble, I just was reminded when I'm going through this about well, one time when I was in Bible college and there a lady in the office of where I was working that her niece had this horrible accident and died and she was just totally broken and being able to just minister and talk to her and bring comfort and peace. God may put you in situations to be able to be that voice that, may, that isn't there for other people to be there to present who Jesus wants them to be. It's our command to go. To go and do. Be willing to go. Because he said we will go. And in Acts 1, Jesus gives them four locations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other parts of other, <laughs> the ends of the earth. And as we look in the book of Acts, it shows us they fulfilled this. If we look at Acts 1 through 7, they started in Jerusalem, their hometown. Where is your hometown? We're not in Jerusalem, but where is your Jerusalem? Where is your neighborhood? Where is that area that you know? Where is it that people know you? Is your life giving that testimony of who Christ is? People around you, do they see the light of Christ or are they not? Back to Galatians, we keep honing in on this passage, but it's just to me one that fulfills following Christ, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, that which will come out of your life is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Are those around you in your Jerusalem, your neighborhood, seeing this in your life? Or do they see Karen? I don't think you're the Karen here, but... <laughs> Are they seeing something that is like, why is this person? Who is this person? Next, he tells them to go to Judea and Samaria. That's fulfilled in Acts 8 and 9 for them. And Judea was the southern part of Israel. That means extend, extend beyond your neighborhood. Are you willing to go to areas not like your own to be able to bring the light of Christ? If you get prompted, will you go out of that which is comfort zone for you to another area? I know whenever we would have the festivals for the L.A. Pride that, that there were people who wouldn't darken any part of West Hollywood with any of their shadow at any time, but they would go to be part of the process of this festival because of being at a place that may have been an uncomfortable position for them for the kingdom of God. So we expand it beyond that which we know, that which we're comfortable, to our Judea. Then he says Samaria. Now, if you know the story of Scripture, the Samaritans were outcasts. The Samaritans were a mixed race of Israelites with the captors that had taken them captive. Yes, they still worship Jehovah, but they worship other gods as well. So the people in Judea felt like they weren't true Christian or true Israelites. And how often do we look at people and think, well, they may not be true Christians, or we look at them as second-class citizens, and how many of us have been made to feel like a second-class citizen by other groups of believers? Oh, you can come into, we'll take your attendance, and by all means, we'll take your offering, but don't expect to participate or do anything. Made to feel like a second-class citizen. And so we go to those that we may think, well, maybe they're less than us is where we first start. Always, that's where our mind goes. We'll go to those here, but what about those who are, that we think are better than us? Will we go beyond our comfort zone to a Samaria, to people who we may think, well, they don't need to know, or maybe they've already got experiences, or someone that's just not like us that we're not sure about, will we go? And then, of course, to the ends of the earth, that was to the Gentiles, and that's from Acts chapter 10 through 28. 
There should be no boundaries to our expression of the word of God in our life. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we need to take the love of Christ with us. There are some places that we go that the Holy Spirit needs to be there because there is so much pain, heartache, strife. Will we bring this love of Christ? Will we be a witness? And yes, being a witness will often be with our words. And if God calls you to do that, by all means do it. If you do feel God wants you to pass out a flyer on the street corner or door to door, however, if God has called you that, by all means do it. I personally wouldn't recommend the bullhorn, but if God tells you to do it, do it. But what's the most important? Are you reflecting the life of Christ in your life? Are you the light to this world? Not the dark, not the gloom. I don't even think the boring. Are you the light of Christ to the world? And sure, in Acts 2, we see that they spoke in other tongues and went out to the crowds. And the reason was because there had to be a purpose. There was a great commotion that happened in that upper room that people around noticed. And it was a festival happening in that town at the time. Jerusalem was full of people from all over that part of the known world. They all came to Jerusalem for this festival, speaking different languages, and by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, speaking through the disciples in all these different languages, it was able to empower them to speak the message that was then carried back to their hometown. So the message of Christ continued on throughout the world. They understood a language that they did not know. And I do believe this can happen today. I've heard witnesses of it happening today. And I grew up Pentecostal, so I believe it is possible for us today. But I don't believe that it's the only evidence of the Holy Spirit in our life. It is one of the ways that God had made us to show that the, po the Holy Spirit was with them. The Apostle Paul gives us nine outward signs of the supernatural power of God in 1 Corinthians 12. And we're not going to read it, but you can study it on your own. But, and many theologians look at that nine gifts or a list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they're thinking that's not exhaustive. But it's a start. It gives us an understanding, and it makes us realize there are various ways for us to operate and show the power of God in our life. But most certainly, all of us should have what we read in Galatians 5, those through the Spirit. Those should be evident no matter what task we take on in life. This other should be evident within our life. Those fruits are definitely the evidence of the Holy Spirit. To be peaceful when things aren't very peaceful. To be loving to the unlovable. To have joy in turmoil. And you can do the, continue the other six on your own. But it just shows us that these are the reason the Holy Spirit was sent, was to help us carry out the message of the work of Christ to our, old, to our whole world. And sometimes it seems that, that somehow we have missed that in the church, that somehow we think it's just for us and no more. But God has redeemed us and restored us, and he wants us to carry this message to others. And no, it won't be by human effort alone. Yes, it takes our effort, but it's not by our power, but the power of God working in us. So when Jesus left the work of the church in our hands to the disciples so many years ago, it was for them to carry their work beyond themselves to others. And that work has been continued on for 2,000 years. And that's how the kingdom of God grows, as the faithful teach the faithful to teach other faithful. It's the growing and building of the church of Jesus Christ. So will we take these three proclamations that were proclaimed to them to our own heart? Will we spend time waiting for God in our lives, through waiting for God's leading and direction of what next in our life? Will we be open to the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you just that set that you're like, oh, no, God, I've, I've already done my time or, or I'm too old. Moses was 80 when he started his commitment to following Christ. Are we going to allow things to keep us from doing those things? Are we afraid to allow the Holy Spirit into our life of what he may ask? God knows your abilities. He created your abilities. He's just going to enhance those abilities to be able to do even more than you ever thought possible. And then will you go? Will you go into that community, whether it's your local grocery store or your neighbor? Will you expand to other areas where God may take you and lead you to present this light of Christ to our world? That's what it's all about. Our world needs us so badly. We need this embodiment of the power of Christ in our life. We need the healing and the helping of the Holy Spirit in our hurting world. And that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. That was the promised presence of God. 
will we say yes to Jesus? We say yes, we'll learn. Yes, we'll receive. And yes, we'll go. Let's pray. God, I, I thank you, Lord, for these passages that help humanize people that we have so lifted up on pedestals that you call this ragtag group of disciples to become your first church to help people see you working in individuals and god that has passed on to now we look at ourselves and think god how can you ever use a vessel like me i'm flawed i got issues there's things that uh, troubles in life that just keep me from from being able to be that the who i even think i should be and lord that's where we come before you and thank you that you use the flawed to reach other flawed people that you help us to be able to be used for your kingdom, your purposes, to bring to our world that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, that they see that in our life, to be able to see a light, a hope, a, a brightness of, in the future that if we just look at our world can just be dismal and disappointing. But God, we have your abundant life, your life of the Spirit that can flow through us. So God, as we open ourselves up, and, be rece and receive the Holy Spirit. Congregation, be filled with the Holy Spirit in your life now. Allow God to stir up those things in your heart and life, and then be willing not to just think about it, but to go. Lord, we just want to prepare ourselves and do the things you've called us to do for your purposes and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, we will take prayer requests. Uh, are there any requests that people have that you'd like to present? Yeah, Andre, please. other comments don't seem to be coming up for them um, online so uh, another technical glitch glitch um, we love technology when it works <laughs> so and it has all right well let's go to God in prayer and if you got requests you didn't want to express you can obviously express them from your own heart God we thank you Lord for the power of the Holy Spirit that encourages us that refreshes us that leads us and guides us and and God we thank you that we're not in this process alone that uh, you haven't abandoned us, that you are with us till the end of the age, and you will continue nudging us and directing us and encouraging us in very aspects of our life. So, God, we just ask you continue to work in each heart. And, God, we thank you for the report that Andre uh, gave. Uh, we thank you that uh, surgery went well. We thank you that things are, the recovery seems to be going well. Lord, we just continue to ask for continued healing and strength. And God, we uh, pray for the family issue that they're having right now. And God, we know how disruptive that can be and how emotionally upsetting it can be. Lord, we ask that you minister love and peace to that family. God, the whole situation, you know the outcome, how it needs to go. You know what needs to transpire. And God, uh, Andre's asking for your wisdom in this situation. And God, that you allow him to have some knowledge and understanding that that supernatural ability to know, God, he needs that now. And Lord, that even others in the family, that they also receive that ability, that supernatural ability to know and to act and to speak. Lord, we just ask that you minister to that family. Lord, for Stacy, we bring her before you with the loss of her mom. And God, we know the heartache that she must be going through and can sense the the just the weight of it all especially since she's having to go through it by herself i ask oh god that you bring support around her of friends and loved ones who can bring that encouragement and guidance that that she is going to need and that you put a peace within her own heart that that uh, she too will be able to sense you working there and to call out to you for that help god we ask that you minister to her in the name of jesus and and god we also pray for um anyone in the congregation that whatever they're going through whether financial physical emotional uh, 
spiritual, relational, whatever it is, oh God, we call out to you for your help and your strength and the guidance of your Holy Spirit to help encourage us and nurture us so that we can go out into our world and be those things that you called us to be, that we be able to show the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and allow your light to shine through us. God, I just ask your continued blessing on our congregation, upon our work that we are establishing here, and God, that as we uh, do the various tasks that need to be done, oh Lord, that you open up every door, that you make every provision, and that you allow us to reach out to this, this community, our Jerusalem, that needs to hear from you so badly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So at this time, we're going to have, it's Sherry, right? Sherry's going to announce next time. Good morning, y'all. First of all, I guess we are wanting to welcome everybody to our new home. And in welcoming everybody to our new home, that brings up the issue of the building fund. And we have a lot of things that we need to take care of. Um, our music department, Fellowship really needs uh, new computers. There's some we need. Would like to have some stage brought up here. Um, there's some things with the city that we're going to have to be taking care of. So we could really use a little support on the home improvement fund. Um, if we could just take a moment and bow our heads and maybe pray over that building fund. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with this new church, our home. We thank you for our pastor, Pastor Gerald, who nurtures us spiritually and for the fellowship that we experience here every Sunday. Through our, our church members and through you, God. We give our offerings to you now to support the ministry and to support us in this community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Membership matter. So um, if anybody is interested in becoming a member, please um, contact Marcos. Marcos, raise your hand. I think everybody know, here knows who he is. Um, and we can set up a time to do a membership class for you, whether it's uh, via Zoom, um, one-on-one -on -one with each other, whatever you're comfortable with, we can make that happen for your membership class. For Bible study, Bible study is held here on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. in our fellowship hall, and you can also join us through Zoom. And the Zoom ID number is up there. I don't think I need to repeat it for y'all. And... Um, now if we could just take a moment and pray over our tithes and offerings. Oh, gracious Father, bless our tithes and offerings we are about to give to you today as we offer back a portion of what you have given to us. We offer you these gifts as symbols of our gratitude. And may we always find comfort in your strength and in your name. We ask this in your powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Team, as they sing us out.
take the Jesus within you out to our world and let people know of God's love, grace, and acceptance. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Amen. For he is worthy.